Before today's video starts, we just want to bring you a word from our sponsor, NordPass. I always thought that using Google or Facebook was a great way to log in to different websites. It was just so convenient. But what would happen if a hacker got a hold of my Google or Facebook password? I can't even imagine how many important sites they would have access to, or things could get so much serious, like my identity could be stolen, loans could be taken out of my name, and who knows what else could happen. It would be a nightmare. This is why I now use NordPass, which is an easy to use and very secure password manager. I know I can trust NordPass because it's from the creators of NordVPN and I've been using them for years. I've never had a problem. NordPass has a great autofill feature and it'll also generate strong passwords for you. So I'm no longer using one password for a bunch of different sites. One tool I really like in NordPass is the data breach scanner because it gives me peace of mind. You can use it to find out if your online account or credit card information has been leaked. It'll identify where and when the leak happened and what type of data was compromised. NordPass has a great deal for criminally listed viewers. Get 50% off a two-year NordPass premium plan at nordpass.com slash criminally listed or use the code criminally listed. Plus, you'll get an additional month for free. They also have a 30-day money-back guarantee so you'll have nothing to lose. Keep yourself safe online and check out NordPass today. Number 3. Jennifer San Marco Jennifer San Marco was born in December 1961 in Brooklyn, New York. She was described as shy and she mostly kept to herself, but she did play with other children on occasion. She attended both Brooklyn College and Rutgers University, but she didn't graduate from either. In 1989, San Marco moved to the West Coast. San Marco usually didn't stay at one job for very long. For a while, she was a correctional officer at Chuckawalla Valley State Prison in Blythe, California. Then she got a job as a police dispatcher in Santa Barbara, California. In 1997, she landed a job sorting mail at the U.S. Postal Department's Mail Distribution Center in Goleta, California. For the first time, she settled into her job. She bought a condo in Santa Barbara, not far from her workplace. She generally kept to herself, but she would join in conversations with co-workers when opportunities arose. Around 2001, San Marco's co-workers noticed a change in her personality. She became withdrawn, irritable, and she would talk to herself. One day, she made a disturbing comment to a co-worker. The co-worker reported the comment and San Marco was told to come to the manager's office. She refused and then caused a scene. The police were called and San Marco was taken into custody. She was held for 72 hours for a psychiatric evaluation. Afterward, San Marco was allowed to return to work, but she had to keep away from her co-worker. Jennifer San Marco remained at the distribution center for two more years. Then in June 2003, she was forced to retire for medical reasons. A month later, she sold her condo. She told several people she was going to visit her sister who lived back east. She then drove away from Goleta in her car. Her car broke down near Grants, New Mexico, so she decided to stay there. It wasn't long before her neighbors and Grants started to notice her strange behavior. This included talking to herself and getting down on her knees to pray in the middle of the road. One time she was pulled over by the police while driving her car. She was half naked in the car. One day San Marco walked into the Milan village administrator's office. She said she wanted a business license. She planned on starting a paper called The Racist Press. She wanted to use the paper to publish her bizarre conspiracy theories. For example, she believed that the government could control people and force them to kill other people. She was ultimately denied the business license. In August 2005, San Marco went to a pawn shop and despite having a history of mental illness, she purchased a 9mm handgun. On January 30th, 2006, 44-year-old Jennifer San Marco was in Santa Barbara. She went to her old condo where she confronted her former neighbor, 
54-year-old Beverly Graham. They had previously shared a wall. While San Marco lived there, the two women had feuded. Graham was often annoyed when San Marco loudly ranted and raved. San Marco shot her former neighbor several times. She then got back into her pickup truck and drove to Goleta. She managed to get into the parking lot of the distribution center where she used to work by following another vehicle through the entrance gate. She then found an employee and at gunpoint she made him hand over his ID badge. The employee then ran off. San Marco used the badge to get into the building. It's believed that she first shot 37-year-old Z Fairchild, 28-year-old Malika Higgins, and 42-year-old Nicola Grant. Several employees were in the break room and they heard the gunshots. They stepped out of the break room and San Marco smiled as she walked by them. San Marco then walked to her old desk where 44-year-old Charlotte Colton was working. She shot the mother of three in the head. She then walked down the aisles and murdered 42-year-old Guadalupe Shorts and 57-year-old Dexter Shannon. Then 44-year-old Jennifer San Marco shot herself in the head. Every person that San Marco shot died. Her rampage left eight people dead, including herself. Beverly Graham's body was not found until the next day. No one is sure why San Marco killed the people that she did. But based on papers found at her home, San Marco believed that she was the target of a conspiracy theory because of her employment at the mail sorting facility. The brutal mass murder shocked the people of Santa Barbara and Goleta. Many people knew that Jennifer San Marco had a mental health condition, but no one thought she would ever hurt anyone. Number 2. Catherine Shock Catherine Dempsey was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1894. After high school, Catherine attended nursing school in Dunkirk, New York. In nursing school, she was engaged to another man, but then she met Donald D. Shock and she fell in love with him. They got married in 1917, but the marriage didn't last and they were divorced three years later. However, they got back together four years later and remarried. In 1928, Catherine gave birth to a son, James. Donald and Catherine's second attempt at marriage was not more successful than their first. They divorced again in 1931. After that, Catherine went back into nursing. She and James lived with her sister, Ruth Hughes, in Dunkirk, New York. Ruth and her husband were separated, and Ruth helped Catherine take care of James. Then, tragically, James died from an illness in November 1934. He was just seven years old. Catherine was devastated by the loss of her only son. As Christmas approached, she understandably became more depressed. Despite Catherine's unbelievable grief, she planned on spending Christmas with her brother, Walter Dempsey, his wife, Clara, and their four sons. They lived in Perrysville, which is just outside of Pittsburgh. A week before Christmas, Catherine traveled from her home in Dunkirk to Buffalo, New York. She bought some gifts for her family. She also bought a revolver. On December 23rd, Catherine took a cab 200 miles from Dunkirk to Perrysville. The cab driver refused to take a tip and told Catherine that he would call her if he ever needed a nurse. Catherine told him she wouldn't be around anymore. Catherine walked into her brother's family's home with an armful of gifts. They enjoyed the afternoon and evening together. In the early morning hours of Christmas Eve, 38-year-old Catherine Shock picked up the revolver she had purchased a week earlier. She went into the master bedroom and shot her 42-year-old brother, Walter. The gunshot woke up Clara and she tried to run. Catherine managed to shoot her in the side of the head. Catherine then went into the bedrooms of her nephews, 
12-year-old Robert, 10-year-old Walter Jr., 8-year-old Thomas, and David, who was 15 months old. She shot all four of her nephews. Despite being shot in the head, Clara managed to make it out of the house and started screaming for help. One of their neighbors heard her and took Clara to a nearby doctor's office. He then returned to the family's home. Everyone else in the house was dead. This included 38-year-old Catherine Shock. She was found dead at the foot of her brother's bed. It was determined she died by suicide by drinking cyanide. The police found four handwritten notes on the dining room table. In all the notes, Catherine explained that she was devastated by the loss of her son and she couldn't go on with her life. But she doesn't explain why she chose to kill her brother and his family. The police in Dunkirk went to the home Catherine shared with her 37-year-old sister, Ruth Hughes. No one answered the door, so officers forced their way inside. In the home, they found Ruth's dead body. She had been shot to death. The medical examiner thought she had been dead at least two days. That meant Catherine killed her sister and then went to her brother's home. This brought Catherine Shock's body count to seven, including herself. Catherine claimed she committed the mass murder because she was devastated by the loss of her only son. The tragically ironic aspect of the story was that there was a lone survivor of the mass murder. That was Clara, Walter's wife, and the mother of Robert, Walter Jr., Thomas, and David. She had to live with the loss of her entire family. Number one, LaFonda Foster and Tina Powell. LaFonda Faye Foster and Tina Marie Powell met in the mid-1980s when they were both in their 20s and living in Lexington, Kentucky. They eventually started dating. The two women had a history of drug and alcohol addiction. Foster was also a sex worker. On April 23, 1986, 27-year-old Powell and 22-year-old Foster partied through much of the day. That evening, they went looking for more drugs and alcohol. They went to the apartment of 73-year-old Carlos Kearns and his 45-year-old wife, Virginia Kearns. The couple had a live-in housekeeper, 59-year-old Trudy Harrell. Foster and Powell were friends with Virginia. Virginia convinced Carlos to give them a check for $25. Carlos was semi-disabled and he couldn't drive to the bank. Virginia was very drunk, so she couldn't drive either. So Powell, Virginia, and Harold went and got Carlos's car. While they were out, 47-year-old Roger Keane and 52-year-old Theodore Sweet arrived at the Kearns' apartment. Foster, Carlos, Keane, and Sweet then went out to the car. Foster drove to a bait shop where the manager cashed the check. Then they went to the home of a man named Lester Lutterall. Lutterall got into a fight with Foster and Powell. Foster was armed with a 22 caliber handgun and she fired a shot through one of Lutterall's windows. Then they drove off. No one was hit by the bullet. Foster then drove to a field and everyone was ordered out of the car. In the field, 73-year-old Carlos Kearns, 45-year-old Virginia Kearns, and 59-year-old Trudy Harrell were all stabbed and shot. The Kearnses were not fatally injured. The Kearnses and Keen and Sweet, who were unharmed, were ordered to get back into the car. Harold had been stabbed five times in the face and the chest, and her throat had been slit. She had also been shot in the back of the head. Powell then ran over her with the car, and her body was dragged 225 feet into a nearby parking lot. Then they drove to a paint store and parked the car behind it. Virginia Kearns was pulled out of the car. She was stabbed some more and her throat was slit. In total, she was stabbed 16 times in the neck area. Amazingly, the stabs and the gunshot wound didn't kill her. Powell then ran over her and this is what finally killed her. 
Foster and Powell then drove around with the three men for a while. Then they drove to another field and forced them to get out of the car. 47-year-old Roger Keane was shot three times in the head. 52-year-old Theodore Sweet was shot in both the ears. Carlos Kearns, who was 73 years old, was shot twice in the head. All the men's throats were slit as well. Afterward, the car was driven over them, but it became stuck on Keane. While he was pinned under the car, the car was set on fire. LaFonda Foster and Tina Powell then walked to a nearby hospital. Powell went to call a cab from a payphone, and Foster went to the washroom, where she washed some of the blood off. A nurse noticed that both women were splattered with blood, so she called the police. Officers happened to be in the hospital on an unrelated matter. They came and questioned the women. When they did, the officers could smell alcohol on them. Then Foster and Powell became belligerent, so they were arrested. At the jail, Foster managed to trade her bloodstained pants with another inmate's pants. The next day, all five bodies were found. That same day, the pants that Foster was wearing when she committed the murders were retrieved, and in the pockets were 22 caliber bullets. Soon, the two women were linked to all five murders. One thing that connected all the murders was that all the victims were shot with the same 22 caliber handgun. Several people saw Powell and Foster with a handgun on the night of the murders. Also, the victims had been stabbed and cut with the same knife. Earlier that night, Powell had tried to sell the knife to a group of people. While in jail, Foster confessed the murders to another inmate. They said they wanted to kill the women because they were bitches. Then they had to kill the men because they had seen too much. Foster talked about laughing when they committed the murders. She also said she was as good of a call leader as Charles Manson. Tina Powell and LaFonda Foster went to trial in February 1987. Powell's lawyer said that Powell was a battered victim of Foster. The lawyer claimed that Powell only participated in the murders because she feared her abusive partner would kill her if she didn't. Foster's lawyer said that Foster was so wasted that she had no idea what was going on. The trial lasted about three weeks, and then over three days, the jury deliberated for 21 hours. They were both found guilty of all five murders. Tina Powell was sentenced to five life sentences. She was able to apply for parole after 25 years. LaFonda Foster was sentenced to death. She was only the second woman in the 20th century to be sentenced to death in Kentucky. The first woman was Laverne O'Brien, who was convicted in 1980 of poisoning two of her husbands. O'Brien's death sentence was commuted to life in prison in 1980. LaFonda Foster's date with the electric chair was supposed to be April 22, 1988. But her lawyers appealed and her execution date was pushed back. The appeal argued that Foster and Powell should have been tried separately. In December 1991, the Kentucky Supreme Court quashed her death sentence and she was ordered to have a new sentencing hearing. For years, there was a legal battle regarding the sentencing hearing. In 1996, Foster said she was sick of being in jail 23 hours a day alone and she was ready to die. Another three years went by, then in January 1999, nearly seven years after her death sentence was reversed. Foster agreed to a plea deal. She accepted life in prison without the chance of parole. At the time of this video, 63-year-old Tina Powell is serving her sentence at the Kentucky Correctional Institution for Women in Shelby County, Kentucky. She was first eligible to apply for parole in April 2011. It was deferred for 10 years. She was able to apply again in April 2021. Her parole was denied and was ordered she would have to serve out the rest of her sentence in prison. 
LaFonda Foster is 58 years old and she is serving her sentence at the same prison. Both women will most likely die in prison. Thank you so much for watching today's video. And now, here's a short clip from our latest paranormally listed video, Three Portals to Hell. Number 1. Bobby Mackey's Music World, Kentucky, USA Bobby Mackey's Music World is a nightclub in Wilder, Kentucky that also offers ghost tours. The club has a dark history with links to the occult. In the 1800s, the building was used as a slaughterhouse. In the late 1800s, the site attracted satanic worshippers who met in the abandoned building once the slaughterhouse was shut down. In the 1930s and 40s, the building was a casino. Eventually, the owner was forced out by the mob. New owners took over and were repeatedly arrested on gambling charges during the 1950s. Then it became a Hard Rock Cafe. When the Hard Rock Cafe closed in January 1978 after several people were shot dead on the site. Bobby Mackey is a country music singer and he had no desire to own a nightclub. But then he fell in love with the two-story clapboard building. He had never been in the building before but he felt deja vu when he entered it. You can find a link to the rest of the video on the screen now. There is also a link to the channel in the description box below this video. Thanks again for watching.